Francesco Malcó eh, va a hablarnos sobre Crime and Right. Está claro. Eh, he is a, an Italian historian uh, of architecture. Uh, he has been director of the Department of History of Architecture since 1994. Professor of History at the Yale School uh, 19... Uh, Many, uh, many, years many, years ago. many years ago. So, uh, he is the director of the Casabella, the uh, land of the journal we love in architecture. Yes. So, uh, I think the best is you, you, uh, you uh, start. Are you yeah. going to talk in, in, in what language? Which one do you prefer? Uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm not so. No? What do you prefer? No? It's more or less the same. In some in some cases, I can uh, I can speak in English. In some cases, I I'll speak in Italian. In some cases, I try with my Italiano, which is very uh, something uh, about a language, which give you the possibility to to laugh a little bit. Um, well, I try in English, uh, also if my English is pretty rusty, and uh, in some cases will be not so easy to explain some of the concept I would like to share this evening with you. Um, the, this conversation of this evening is related to uh, an idea that uh, I nourished during the last uh, years, working in my own uh, field, uh, which is history of architecture. Uh, history of architecture is a discipline which uh, grew up uh, from, uh, from uh, the love for art. Before uh, the attempts uh, that uh, during the 16th century we did to give an interpretation of the art uh, phenomenon, the real first interest was related to the love for the objects of art. From these roots, continuously a new discipline was developed which uh, produced what we know, history of art. To give an interpre historical interpretation of the reasons why we love a certain object, a certain byproduct of the art activities. And this uh, left uh, a deep, uh, a deep footprint in uh, the way in which uh, we started to be historically interested in the byproduct of the architectural activity. It's normal, also today, to speak uh, and to analyze the work of architecture using the same tools and the same uh, approaches which had been uh, developed by the historian of art. In other terms, we still describe buildings. We can uh, give interpretation why they were built, the reasons why, which was the relationship between the architect and the client, which was the role of, this, uh, of a given buildings in a certain uh, social or historical or cultural environment, but do you still describe? We missed uh, to, to have a finally, to have a finally a real discipline which could be called uh, and uh, enjoy the definition of history of architecture, we should, uh, we should take a step ahead which is based on the fact that we need to understand how the buildings are built, which are uh, the knowledges involved uh, in the construction activities, which are the deep relationship between uh, the technical form of knowledges and uh, the design activity. It's not more enough to speak of the relationship between engineering and architecture. We need to perceive that there is something which is much more complex, 
which involves also form of knowledges and form of production which are much more complicated than those expressed by these two terms, engineering and architecture. And uh, I think that only when we'll be able to grow up a new generation of, of uh, historians of architecture which are able to speak in the same moment uh, the language of the designers and uh, the language of the engineering, knowing that between these two terms there is a gigantic ocean of form of knowledges to be understood and investigated, that we'll have something which is appropriate to express the real historical meaning of the byproduct, uh, using Miss van der Rohe terms, of a discipline which gave names to the ages, which express the only one which is able to express in full the meaning of an entire epoch. For this reason, I assumed uh, an object like this, the Guggenheim, because analyzing and uh, discussing very, very simply in a very primitive way the history of this building, you can perceive the complexity of the form of knowledges that we have to use to give an interpretation of this nature. Going away to the normal, stupid interpretation of a continuous space, a continuous <coughs> movement, a building which is uh, in itself concluded, uh, not able to have any kind of a relationship with the environment around, and, and so on and so on. All the explanation that usually are associated uh, with the interpretation of the Guggenheim. The Guggenheim is a place, and uh, this is a peculiar, you see the reason why I'm explaining, I need to express uh, my uncomfortable position in the field of history of architecture is due to the fact that when you are trying to challenge a building like the Guggenheim, really you need so many tools and so many approaches that uh, no one of the disciplines that we have now, from an historical point of view, it's appropriate, even enough. The story of the Guggen, very simple, probably you know it very well, and I'm repeating something that you know. Something very strange. 1943, when they started to build the, bu the buildings, they were very old. Both the client and Frank Lloyd Wright were very old. Frank Lloyd Wright never built a building in, uh, in New York before. He was far away from New York. And the story started from this lady, Hilary Byfon, Aaron Weissen, uh, a mediocre painter, but uh, extremely well uh, related uh, with all the avant-garde movement in Europe. Uh, due to the problems uh, that uh, were afflicting the life in Germany during the 20s, he arrived in New York and he entered in friendship with this man, Solomon Guggenheim, the rich, one of the richest, uh, one of the richest uh, capitalist in this time in the uh, United States. Jewish. Jewish. The Guggenheim is Jewish. This is the first thing that we have to say. The Guggenheim is the Jewish answer to Museum Modern Art and Rockefeller Center. And this is just something that implies the use of some peculiar to tools from an historical point of view. Just to analyze this aspect. aspect. And so Hilary Rebade did a, a painting, a portrait of Solomon Guggenheim. They became very friend. They were traveling through Europe, visiting the most interesting place in Europe, the South, Bauhaus, uh, Paris, and so on. When Karl Nierendorf, 
the most important the most important uh, art dealer in New York which arrived there in 1936 just because uh, in Germany as you know the contemporary art was forbidden by the Nazi power and he became the most important dealer of the great artists of the avant-garde and mainly of Kandinsky and mainly of Klee when uh, Karl Niedendorf died in 1937 one year before, Guggenheim bought the entire estate, which is which was composed, if I'm not wrong, of 327 clays, for instance. The dimension of the collection of Guggenheim was gigantic. And for this reason, uh, first they exhibited them, the Guggenheim fam family, in uh, the suite uh, they rented in the Plaza Hotel in New York. Afterwards, they organized their first museum, as you can see here, the first images. And uh, finally, they decided to build a museum. Hilary Bay was the consultant, and even more, she was the director of the Solomon Guggenheim Foundation at the time. And when uh, Solomon took the decision to build his own museum, Hilary Bate investigated uh, through the emigre architects and artists, uh, Amer uh, German emigre, emigre and uh, artists and architects who could be the best choice. He received uh, from L Lazzaro Molinaggi a long list, including uh, the name, obviously, of Molinaggi himself, not so, not so nice, I would say. Uh, not so polite, no, Manuel. Some qualche cosa che non si fa. Uh, and um, <coughs> Gropius, uh, Le Corbusier, Miss, Mendelssohn, and so on and so on. No right in the list. Another interesting topic to think about. And uh, Hilary Byte was convinced in 1923, just to give you another inch inside this, uh, the several meaning of this story, she was convinced that Frank Lloyd Wright was dead. But she spoke uh, with Irene. Irene was born in Rothschild, and she was Solomon's wife. And Irene said, why don't you try Wright? And she wrote a ter an incredible letter to Wright, uh, the most rhetoric letter you can ever think a client could write to an architect. I want you to build a mausoleum, I want to build a temple, I want you to build a church for the non-objective art. This was the only clear thing. Gegenstand los art. L'art without object. This was very clear, the only thing. Afterwards it was a museum, it was a place for big events, a church, a temple, and so on and so on. And Wright didn't answer to this letter. Three days, three weeks afterwards, Hilary Bay went to Solomon Guggenheim, and she said, Wright didn't answer to my letter. Solomon took some of his stationery and wrote, Dear Mr. Wright, I would like to meet you. Sign. Solomon Guggenheim. One day afterwards, Wright went to meet Solomon Guggenheim because it was very, very, very different to receive a letter from Solomon Guggenheim, one of the richest persons in America, and uh, or Hilary Bay. So the, start, the story started. And uh, the story is interesting because Wright received a contract in 1943 to build the museum for one million euros. Well, sorry, sorry. Marzia, <laughs> uh, uh, I am Italian, and so we are so obsessed with the problem of euros, uh, euros spread and the policy of our government in this moment that I cannot escape to, to think about uh, my checking account, uh, which should nourish my daughter for the future. And so uh, this is a big problem. 
in reality was one million dollars. And um, um, but you know, it, the the structure of the contract was very interesting. Uh, right should uh, invest, should decide in the same time where to build the building with one million dollars to buy the land for the building, to build the building and to pay for his for for um, for his uh, salary. And Wright uh, did the most intelligent thing. He went uh, to this man. This, when you go to New York, when you arrive to Kennedy or from any other place, when you go up uh, on the Hudson River to Columbia and so on and so on, you are always running on bridges and highway that this man built. This is Robert Moses. He's the man who designed New York. He was the chief of Park, he was the Park Commissioner of New York for more than 30 day, years. And uh, he shaped the New York, all the infrastructures, all the big investments in uh, public construction, housing, and so on, were done by, and obviously, and obviously, Moses was very interested in the, in the real estate market. He was the most important expert in New York at this time. And Wright went to him and said, where can I find the land? Not so expensive, because I have one million euros. I have to pay for the building, and I have to pay by myself also, for, which was a very complicated program. And this man suggested to build a building far away on the Hudson, outside of New York. Why? Because Solomon Gomer was thinking to build it immediately a new highway to reach this facility. He was the richest person in New York. Can you figure out that every people going through the bridges on the Hudson River, on the East River, were paying a nickel and there were trucks that every night were transferring this fresh money in the pocket of Robert Moses. So his interest was to build street, to create new approaches. He's the man who invented Staten Island, who invented the Long Islands, who invented the beaches, just to do what? The traffic in the, on the bridges is reduced during the weekends no trucks, no commercial traffic, and so on. But if you wanted to keep the business profitable, you have to increase the number of the people, and so you have to open the beaches outside, and so the people will use. This was Robert Moses. And he suggested to Wright to build the building outside. And Wright described the building to Moses, to, sorry, the, the building to, to his client, and say, it would be a building composed of very different, uh, of very different uh, bodies. Uh, very confused description of a building distribu distributed in the nature. But we don't have any drawings of that. But it's very clear that this was the, the, the decision. This is Robert Moses. So these are some of, his, of examples of what he did there. But. Remember, Jewish. Solomon say, no, no way. I want my building in Manhattan. I want my building in the center of Manhattan. It's all right, probably before Christmas 1943, presented to him this first scheme, which is exactly from uh, a distribution and uh, from a conceptual point of view, exactly what we see. A great slab, a great unique plan with uh, a body, in this case a shape uh, in, uh, with this geometrical form, and uh, another body nearby. The platform, something which is uh, a higher continuous exhibition space, and here uh, something which is not very clear because it was, it was thought at the beginning as the apartment of Hillary by, 
and this is the first scheme. I'm pretty sure that this came out in, uh, uh, before the beginning of 1944. I have no proof of that, if you want, but it doesn't change anything. But it was 1943. And this house the building it was designed. And uh, as you can see, the main idea that a unique unitarian space in the center was already very, very clear from the beginning. Obviously, it was divided in plans. But already, the fact that the light was entering from these uh, skylights from the top, and already the fact that there was no windows looking outside. Jewish center of New York, right, doesn't know which is the area. They didn't buy the He didn't buy the area. He, di he did this project just for a nowhere, just as a project. Something which could be interesting to discuss with all these guys that are speaking of Genius Lochi as a, a fundamental tool for an architect. This masterpiece was conceived without knowing the area where it would be, it will be built. The ideas. The Gordon Strong Automobile Objective, one of the most incredible ideas ever an architect could have, only in America. Sugarloaf Mountain, nowhere place, a kind of Babelic Tower, which is an highway. This is just an highway. To bring the car in the top, to look at Sugarloaf Mountains. Nowhere. Just an attraction for tourists. Inside, a gigantic planetarium. But the idea of the spiral, we have seen. You see? How, which are how different, how unpredictable are the roots of the big ideas in architecture. The other one is instead a masterpiece. It's the Johnson's, Johnson Walks administration building in Racine. And here, in this moment, analyzing these columns these mushroom columns, we started to need, we historians, we start seriously to need the work, the knowledge of our friend, historian, or engineers. These columns are really something. They are in function of the idea of cantilevering. All the work of the great work of Wright are cantilevered. The tool of Wright is cantilevering. If you think also the the most popular one, the the falling water, it's cantilever. Everything is cantilevered, and this is a masterpiece of cantilevering, developing the idea that we have inside, the represented by the mushroom, the mushroom columns. Interesting for our, for our friends in engineers. This column was designed by the man who designed it afterwards, the Guggenheim, who was not trained as an architect, as an engineer, as nothing. And he was a genius. He was just able to build. And you see, there is another aspect entering our history. We know we really we would like to have this this famous proof. Uh, they obliged to build a one to one scale uh, model of the mushroom column. They put a lot of weight on the top and afterwards. Frank Lloyd Wright, who is here, 
said uh, put more, put more, three times more what was required by the rules. And only in this move, uh, moment he moved and he wanted to touch the column under it. Another idea. This is the mother of the Guggenheim. Between uh, the mushroom columns, there are these uh, skylights which brings the light inside. And we saw that in the Guggenheim, all the light arrived from the skylight, uh, dividing to cantilever the plan plans. And uh, right to the decided to build this in this way, which is one of the most funny things you can figure out. This is the, I explain afterwards how it's built. Huh? This is the entrance uh, using the same technique you see. These are the skylight. This is the skylight of the cupola in uh, the entrance of the administration building in Racine. And this is exactly the cupola that Wright designed for the Guggenheim, but was not able to build it. And we have to understand why he was not able to build it. But this is exactly what he designed. The, this is the way in which uh, the skylight worked in, uh, it's too complicated. This is the way in which they built it. He went, uh, one day he was in Racine. He went, he saw a shop where they sold the tools for chemical and pharmaceutical equipment. And he decided to use these glass tubes to build the skylight of uh, the administration building in Racine. Obviously, obviously the rain was entering in any place in the building. It was a disaster. When John Mr. Johnson gave to Wright uh, the job to build this, which is the second part of the of the administration building he wrote to write a fantastic letter. I want you to build everything as you like, but I don't want to go through another nightmare similar to that. We are going through every day for your skylights here because we need a roof to keep the rain outside of our buildings. This was the simple request of the client. And the answer right is fantastic. He said, OK, you are complaining. I am using what I experimented in your building for a client, Solomon Guggenheim, who is paying $1 million to build a new museum. In other terms, he was saying to him, you are nothing. I have a real client who is able to understand what I'm doing. What I did experiment it for you, which is the privilege that you had to have something built in this very, very primitive way. The theme of the spiral inside was also experimented in writing relationship to a, a cupola skylight in the gift shop in uh, San Francisco. But we arrived to the project now, 1944. For this reason, I insisted that this, for me, <laughs> the project uh, of the octagonal, of, on the octagonal plan is 1943. And a uh, few weeks afterwards, he sent these two schemes. Please see. This is the Guggenheim, but still he didn't know where to build. There is no area for that, but this is the Guggenheim. And it's strange. 
the mother of this project is the Sugarloaf automobile objective we saw before. And this was just uh, a form without any of the <coughs> symbolic meaning that we are using to attach to the sp spiral forms. Because he used it for a, a such a prosaic project as it was the Sugarloaf Objective Planetarium. So it can be continued, used as you want. You can reverse it. You can invert it. It's indifferent. The shape is this one, but it is indifferent. But <coughs> this is the solution. Wright is offering the two options, but this is the solution because it's cantilevered. <coughs> and uh, when in 1944, he did this famous and extremely beautiful project. All the Guggenheim is here represented. The unique platform is the same. The second body is the same. The ramps are transfor transformed completely. The first idea of the hexagonal plan is a continuous space. It's a continuous cantilevered space around a great em empty space. And uh, finally, there is something more. Ziggurat is the name. And here there is written Tarujits, which is the same word inverted. A palindrome. This building is just a palindrome. You can revert it. Not uh, any difference. The only very clear thing, just from the beginning, object of the continuous debate and the object of the, uh, the origins of the way in which the building was built, is that uh, it's not, uh, it's exactly from a structural, from a static point of view, the opposite of this way of building high-rise building, which shaped the entire Manhattan. This is repetitive <coughs> post and bean system. Exactly the opposite is this one. <coughs> when finally the building, a building who doesn't have any land still, is uh, designed in this way, but is, as you can see, is still a palindrome because it can stay in a corner of a street or another corner. Never mind. It changes. Irrelevant what there is around. <coughs> and further development of the project. <coughs> and uh, the most interesting part of this uh, set of drawings are represented by the continuous variation not only of the number of the uh, the dimensions, uh, the uh, the eye of the of the spring, but uh, also by the dimension, which is an object of continuous investigation, of the uh, of the ramp. This is very close. It's very more or less close to the to the final pro solution. There is only a very funny thing. Here you, you can see there is a, a telescope to admire the stars. Because uh, Hilary Bay said that the greatest experience from which she was not so intelligent. In. But are you taping? Afterwards we take away this. Uh, she was not a genius, I mean. She was a brilliant, uh, a fantastic lady. Uh, but she thought that uh, the Kandinsky Gegenstand Law's art was coming from the admiration of the star, a little bit uh, mechanic way of interpreting. 
to give you how many comp how different are the stories involved and how many tools we need. So finally, in uh, August 1945, the, the model is presented. Here, all around, uh, some example of the collection of Solomon Guggenheim. Here, the model of the skyscraper. And here, at the presentation, Wright was a genius to capture another fundamental aspect of all the work he devoted uh, to the building of the Guggenheim to capture the attention and the favor of the public opinion. And the first uh, tool that he invented to capture the attention of the pu public opinion, we are in 1945, the first uh, atomic bomb were already exploded and the fear in the United States of the Soviet bombs was so strong that he captured the most <laughs> clever, diabolic invention. He said, when New York will be touched by the first atomic bomb, this building will jump in the air. And as it is a perfect spring, will jump on the soil and find again its own position. Can you imagine this explanation, which is so, from one side, so intelligent to explain which is the nature of the building, the structural nature of the building. It's spring. But to capture the imagination of the people, and to express also another great idea, the building was not related to any place. It can jump on New York. And uh, this is the structure of the building, where the problem of the dimension of the span of the ramps, as you can see, is uh, continuous. There is no cantilever. They are not cantilevered inside. And this will be one of the greatest transformations. Represented by the development of this idea, we know very well. It's the same idea of uh, Johnson Walks. The skylight here, the bones. The problem is to decide if Wright conceived this part as a continuous beam or not. It's a very interesting topic to discuss. Or he considered the beam, the ramp, as a supporting both the outside part and the interior part, as in, real, in reality happened. And from uh, the giving up to the idea to have a continuous ramp, a continuous ramp, as in the beginning of the development of the structural project, the Guggenheim became the most resistant and weak building we know. It's resistant and weak. It's fragile and resistant. Another oxymoron that uh, is a, a rhetorical figure that we should be trained to enter in this project. These are some of the different solutions for this. And here the, the ramp, the continuous ramp, which should have a shape like a new. Obviously to, to challenge the position of the neutral axis. Theoretically, this should be the way of building the ramp. This is not the way in which the ramp had been built. This was at the origin of the, of the idea of the first static project, which developed further, as you can see, arriving to this moment when still we have a continuous beam, 
But it's very clear that the interiors are cantilevered. Before, when we saw the model, when we saw the, uh, the, the first model, as you remember, they were not cantilevered inside. They were cantilevered only outside. But now, when we arrive to this point, uh, they are cantilevered outside and cantilevered outside. Here doesn't change a lot. And here is some of the, I don't remember, 1947 project. In this moment, Wright knows where the building will be built. There are the area, a fantastic area on Fifth Avenue in front of Central Park was acquired by the Salomon Guggenheim Foundation. Wright is using this this name, also the name, the chain, the onomastic structure of the way, <laughs> of the way in which Wright explained it is fantastic. When uh, he arrived to, when Solomon Guggenheim died, and he was alone, uh, and uh, he had a lot of problems with uh, <coughs> his nephew and uh, his client and so on, he called him the Solomon Guggenheim Memorial to give to them uh, a very clear message. If you are cancelling the project, you are cancelling the memorial of the man who established your fortune, and so on and so on. So it's clever. It's a very clear person. And he understood very well. He was very old. He understood very well how important it was to have a good relationship, social relationship. And he hired an apartment where, obviously in the plaza where Solomon Guggeni had his own apartment to show his paintings of Kandinsky. And uh, he transformed it. It was the same um, Christian Dior. Yes, Christian Dior. Christian Dior used to, to use this, this apartment at the plaza. Uh, right, rented it and transformed it. This is the way in which he reshaped the Christian <coughs> Dior. All the things were produced by him. And he became uh, a star. He was in all the television. He was speaking in all the newspaper. He was speaking in all the radios. He did uh, a story when Marilyn Morrow married Miller, Arthur Miller, and she, he convinced her to give, as a gift for the marriage to Arthur Miller, a project by him. And uh, Anne Baxter was his niece, the very beautiful Anne Baxter. And she was running all the relationship in the apartment of Wright in this moment, because he needed to overcome all the resistance that were growing up mostly in the artistic, among the artists, among the conservators, among the director of the museums, among the Museum of Modern Art, which was not Jewish, which was Wasp, was Rockefeller. And they were against this museum, new museum. And the artists were saying, in a continuous ramp, our, our paintings will be lost. No order in this museum. And no good light for our paintings. And that they were writing letters to New York Times, and so on, and so on, and so on. <coughs> and Rockefeller wanted to to Solomon Guggenheim, I offered to him, build your museum inside the Rockefeller Center. This is the area. And Hila Rabbe gave to him uh, one of the most intelligent advices she ever gave to his great friend Solomon. They have horrible clays. We have the very good one. 
And, we, and Solomon answered, I have built my museum in Manhattan. So these are old stories that uh, obviously I'm telling you as a joke. Ah, well, this is the keys, very famous, that when they at the end of the, practically before the, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright death, they asked him to pay the bill to the plaza. He did a sketch, a vague sketch, of how he reshaped the Christian Dior apartment and say, okay, I did this, you have been paid. This is a very another key for two reasons. When you enter, when you enter today, when you enter in uh, the Guggenheim Museum, you see this label. It's wrong. 1942. Killer Hilary Bay didn't know right. He was convinced that he was dead. And the first letter arrived, the first letter arrived in 1943. 43. The will, the desire to enlarge this history. And this is the first thing. The second one is the only, only label, speaking of right, in which appears the name of the builder. The only one. Never mentioned. And here, for the first time, the name of the builder is printed at the entrance of the building. Why? It's a good question. The builder. Who was the builder? What he did, which was his role. We need a lot of knowledges, you see. We need a lot of knowledge as people who are able to explain how was the, his company. He was a small company. He was Jewish. A lot, a lot of knowledges, different knowledges. Not enough to explain this building, looking at him and say, it's beautiful. See if we wanted to understand the story. <coughs> These are the protagonists, and each one of them they had a role, an important role. And here is practically the final project, and here is the building as it was built. Another mother, very far away. It's uh, the penguin pools in the London Zoo by this man, Bersod Lubeck. Funny story. I think that we have to finish. We finish here because there is another, a lot of other histories. A funny story. Bertrand Lubetkin was Russian. And uh, obviously, it's very clear to you all the experiments that in, Russian, in Russia did after 1919 in the field of the creation of of a special structure for the theater. Probably you remember the way in which uh, Meyerhold designed his continuous space for the theater, done of spirals. So, Bertha Lubet, he knew all that and transformed the stage destined to be the place for the representation of the glories of the revolution in a pathway for penguins. There is a, sim uh, a close narrative analogies between the story of the spiral biblical shape that Frank Lloyd tried to use it for the sugar loaf for an highway. This banalization to make the shape banal but here enter another great problem, the banalization of the meaning, symbolic meaning of space doesn't mean that uh, this is the process of losing eloquence. It's exactly in some cases the opposite. And uh, here it is. Well, I could uh, speak to you a lot 
to explain how it works, how it stands, how different it is, uh, the interpretation we have, and so on, and so on, and so on. All this is something that uh, could be discussed uh, using uh, your, your tools, the tools of uh, an institute like uh, the Toroya Institute of the knowledge of my great uh, friends uh, from Rome that are explaining to you the work of such a great designer as, as uh, uh, Morandi was. But I wanted to arrive to, just to an end, uh, to conclude. The, we should do several calculations in order to arrive to, uh, to get all the information on how this building stands up, because this is the, at the end, the final questions. It stands up just because it's fragile and it's strong. And this is uh, the peculiar aspect of the way in which Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright built several of his construction. It's a building which mm, okay. Every shape, every shape is nothing as the byproduct of two fundamental activities. One activity is an activity is done on a given material. One is represented by the movement of the naked end, which gave shape. For instance, a ceramic. For instance, a stucco. With that. And now what, another one is the byproduct of the movement of the very same end, but with the tool. The caress of the end, the strength of the knife. These are the origins on what we do, go back to this different attitude. And the Guggenheim is the mix of these two way of working on a plastic material as the concrete is. And everything <coughs> had been used to represent these two movements. I said before, all the project was designed without knowing which was the land, which was the area, which is something very interesting to think. When, he, he, when the Guggenheim, when the museum found an area, it was irrelevant. This is the most beautiful piece of land in New York, but you never, from the Guggenheim, see it. You don't see a tree, you don't see a grass, you don't see nothing. It's irrelevant where we are, where Wright was building. It is irrelevant because its meaning is completely different. It's this large space with this magnificent representation of the play of the equilibrium of the two cantilevered surfaces which are sh which shaped the Guggenheim. And there is something more. You know that in the Guggenheim you arrive, you enter from the top. You need to take an elevator, and afterwards you go down through the ramps. And so your movement is from one side repetitive and from the other side the subject to the strengths, uh, through the strengths of gravity. But at the end, there is this narrow, narrow turn, this narrow, narrow edge, which change completely the direction of any movement inside of the Guggenheim. And this brings to this point. You arrive through a narrow, 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 a movement which is opposite to all the movement we have on in the ramps. And we arrive, arrive here. Why? Why? Why this different movement? Why this inversion of the movement? From the top, a continuous run. But when you arrive, when you arrive to this little pool, 
water inside uh, this special peculiar maternal shape water and maternal shape the beginning of life you are turning away this is oh this is the normal time the normal time of the life but here you arrive to the beginning of the life which is inverted you find the beginning of the life at the end not by chance and here <laughs> the tools of the historian of architecture are not enough and here the importance of the static conception of the Guggenheim the Guggenheim is shaped in this way this is the cantilevered ramps outside these are the cantilevered ramps inside if you design a triangle or a cone assuming the continuity of the line of the outside <coughs> you arrive to this point if you design the interior you arrive to this point the different shape there are two triangle one inside of the other the shape you can see here is uh, the red one is nothing else than the representation of uh, what in ancient time they called sand clocks, clessidre, a tool to measure, a tool to measure the passing of time, as is the interior of the Guggenheim, a representation of passing of time. But not only. The movement of the clessidre, of the clock, of sand can uh, start continuously, can be inverted continuously. And we saw that at the region, the Guggenheim was a palindrome. You can invert it continuously. Finally, having the help of very good engineer and static, we can understand that these dimensions are exactly in relationship to the play of the equilibrium of the forces on the sails which sustain them inside. Thank you.